what what means you I guess like with with Cradle this one as what what was kind of the concept like behind like wanting to get this off the ground and just the the style that you guys chose for so this particular store. Oh gotcha, yeah. So Cradle itself is influenced by a lot of anime. Uh, so there's a lot of just Japanese and Chinese and Korean influence in Cradle itself. So I've always, as an adaptation, seen it as kind of an anime style animation. So when Jay Alima contacted us and he had the same vision for it as we did, we were really excited to make that. And it turned out that I don't use it. Yeah, it was always the animation to me. Yeah. Then. That was going to be my question too. Now, why anime? All right. Good, I skipped sure ahead. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 See, but I'm very excited to be able to to read the books. I um, was researching it, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I have to read books. And I think that they're a quick read. Yes, they are. They are. So one of the big things uh, that I wanted to do with the series was I wanted them all to be have a lot of action, have a lot of motion, have a lot of forward momentum in the plot, and be kind of kind of easy to read. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want them to be too rough. So they're very compressed. They're very condensed, and they really keep it moving. It's really a, a fast roller coaster every installment. So I'm hoping you get through it pretty quick. And the audiobooks are only like 10 to 12 hours, most of them. So they're, they're pretty they're pretty quick reads. That's awesome. Yeah. I can't wait. I'm really glad I'm north. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. So how did the uh, like the actual series like uh, uh, come about? Like, did you, like, how excited were you when you, like, got the project off the ground? I mean, this is your baby, you know? Oh, so excited. Look, one of the things we started to do, Jay Oliva was, was contacting us to try and put, like, a pitch together. But then we heard that studios weren't really taking pitches yet. So we decided, okay, let's, let's put what we can into it to make kind of a sizzle reel, which is sort of like a custom trailer we were doing to use as a proof of concept to show people. So we had that fully animated project going, and we thought, hey, instead of going to the studios for funding, let's we've done Kickstarters in the past, let's try to go to the fans for Kickstarter. And when that started to really become a reality, when we started seeing the art come in for the sizzle reel, which we were originally developing, and we started to see even like my characters that I made up in, in motion doing their their signature moves and stuff, that really felt like a dream of mine had come to life. It really was so cool to see characters I made up getting voiced by incredible people, and now I'm hearing them, and I'm hearing voices that are different than I'm in my head. They're even better. And seeing the character designs, it was really incredible. Did you have any, like, say in, like, uh, the character voices and things yes, like that? Uh, yes, way more than I thought I would. I was totally ready to just hand that over. But mm. Jay wanted to know what my, how I heard the characters... And so I've been on the call with the voice actors every time. So I've been able to hear their takes and kind of give my input. And maybe sometimes I screwed up a line so I get to change it on the fly. But yeah, I had a lot of influence over that. It's been really fun. Nice. Yeah. With the style of animation, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, with Yeren, I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah Yeren, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of seeing resemblance to like a Fire Emblem style. Oh, yeah, for that. Did, how many different concepts did you think you guys went down before you finalized what you thought you were going to pick for this? It's so funny because some characters and some uh, elements of the world took a lot of back and forth. But Yaren in particular, Jay had a really clear vision for her. So she's the, the female lead of the series. And so he wanted to come in with the, for the whole style of the, uh, of the series. He wanted to go with a real 90s anime style because that's something that influenced Jay a lot and influenced me a lot. So that's kind of the direction we were going from the beginning. And with Yaren, we went with a uh, with a swordswoman concept, and she's got something that's reminiscent of like a kendo outfit. And in the books, she has like a magical belt, and we turned that into something that goes over her shoulders, so you can kind of see it in the different shots. And it's a very cool adaptation for I this is probably I came across. Yeah, I'm getting all it. I could see you have you beaten. Oh yeah, we can jump right back into. Yeah, yeah, go. <laughs> yeah. So look, like I said, I mean, I, I know with Kickstarters, uh, you know, sometimes it goes through, sometimes it doesn't, but it seems like you're getting a lot of headway. You get a lot of support. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, you know, do we have like an, a, a window? Are we talking like 20, 20? I know animation is what two years. So that's the that's the thing. So with our Kickstarter, all we could afford to make from the Kickstarter was a feature length animatic. So you're not going to be able to do the full animation for the whole feature length. Uh, and they're trying to leverage this, leverage the amazing fan support we've got, and to hopefully maybe fully animating the feature length app. Hopefully going to series that would be doubly amazing mm -hmm. but whatever we can do to kind of advance the project and we decided what we wanted to do with the money was tell as much of the story as we could because we thought that's what that's what the fans didn't want and right. serve the fans best but let's fan money let's put it into whatever we can get out there in front of the fans so we are going to try to keep moving it forward one step at a time where is it going to go from here i don't know uh but i'm excited and the animatic is supposed to be next year 
So that's supposed to be coming out next year. But if we do end up able to get something fully animated, who knows? That would be super cool. I, I feel like, too, like it'd be a little bit concerning to you, like, you know, get, get the goal here with Kickstarter gets you, you know, get enough to get a, like a demo, basically. Yeah. But if you get it picked up and seen in the studio, does that give you less creative control of your project? You feel like you have to give over the reins a little bit more? All right, so I hesitate to give an official answer to that. <laughs> but I will answer the question about my personal feeling toward that. Like my feeling is, what we really want to do is make sure that the adaptation is something that fans are going to love and it's something that is as you know, faithful to the books as possible, not necessarily in the small details, but in the heart of the story and the characters. And our response has been, do we want a full series more than we want to tell the story in a way that honors the fans? No, we would much rather have a story that is that is consistent. So if it's something that requires us to give up complete and creative control where we have no no say over that, we wouldn't take that idea. Yeah, so that's our that's my position right now. But of course, you know, I don't I'm not I don't have a deal. See that, that is easy to say right now. Well what's more important, like honoring the fans or sort of honoring your actual vision? You the know? fans, hundred yeah. percent. So the, that is that's always been something I've never been married to the particular vision I had. And that's one of the things that when Jay and I started working together, he was asking me yeah, art style wise, how do you picture all things, how do you hear them, how do you see them? And of course I love answering those questions. But then he asked me, okay, so are you are you really tied to this or can we try to play with some things to see if we like it even better? And I went, I'm not married to, to anything except the core of the characters and the core of the story. So because that is what readers came to love about the books. So my feeling always about adaptations is the little minor stuff can change, that it has to change because you're telling in a different medium. But I want to make sure that anybody who sees this story knows it's cradle, feels it's cradle, and it is the story they love. Right, and so I'm not going to compromise anything there because of the readers, not because of my you know transcendent artistic vision. No, yeah. None of that. In other words, it's not going to be. We're not going to read the books and watch the animations. They'll see what the hell. That's what. That's what I hope. That's what I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I see everybody. Your team's got the the creative shirts on. Have we already started talking about merchandising, no pens, stuff like that? Any any figures? <laughs> Well, what is that? we really just kind of had these printed to, to come here. Right. So, but, uh, but it is one of those things where we, we changed the symbol on the first book. Because on the first book, it's a real Chinese symbol that you put on the badge. And it's a Chinese symbol, meaning if to space, basically. Right. So we had done that initially to try and communicate to fans, this is a Chinese-inspired uh, work. So that we could, we could go, we are coming to looking for the right expectations. But as we got bigger and we became a higher project, we, we went, I don't want to misrepresent anything to the audience. Like, this is an authentic Chinese story. Of course, it isn't. So, because of that, we went, when we're going into visual adaptation. We want to represent this as something more original. And so, we went with a new symbol. And so, if we're going with a new symbol, we decided, hey, let's have shirts with the new symbol on it, right? So, we decided to do that. We will eventually end up selling these, but I don't know when. Is there on un- transferring it over to like, uh, a- anime like is there anything that you had to change like story-wise to sort of fit that you know when you oh yeah yeah, there was. yeah already so i wrote the script the the screenplay for the animatic and i was going through my books and and adapting the, the scenes as best i could but there were a few things that just didn't fit so there were a few things that were like okay so for one thing we're trying to fit books one and two into the uh in the night and the animatic which of course is difficult. That's forty-five minutes per book. Now they're not very long books, but that's still that's that's pretty compressed. So there were some things that I think were necessary in the book yeah. that I even if I was rewriting the book now, I'd probably leave out. So there's a thing where I got a chance to do kind of my director's cut version and at least some things I'm cutting for. And there were also some things that so for instance in the books I've talked about this a little bit on YouTube. Well, all right. There was a there are some bully characters, characters who bully the main characters, but I've never liked how bullies are done in movies and TV shows. I felt like it's inauthentic. So I tried to make it a little more nuanced in the book. Well, in the, the animatic, we don't have enough time to do all that nuance, right? So and effectively, I tried to do as much as I could in the script. And then we had a voice actress come in, and she had such a great bully voice for the character that we had to kind of lean into it. So it was one of those things where it still works for the character and still is coming from the culture. But it's a little different of a, a spin on it than there would be at all. Mm-hmm. Like, 
How did they get you involved in this? Like, what what, what was the, the the pitch for the get you get you on board? Uh, so my buddy, uh, who was a voice actor, was a writer, Matt Yang King, and we were collaborating on a couple of projects. And he said, "Hey, have you ever read Cradle?" And I'm like, "What is that? It's a book about babies?" <laughs> and he's like, "No, no, no. It's a uh, you know, it's by Will Blythe. You know, it's, you should check this out. Right? It'd be a great kind of like make it into a series." So I, I I found it on Audible. I listened to the first three books, and I called my manager and I said, "Find out who has the rights." to Right. Uh, and so my manager, you know, uh, contacted the whites, uh, said, hey, you know, uh, Jay Olivo is interested, you know, in, in kind of talking to you guys. And it's funny, so I, I get on a call with the whites, and I do my normal spiel, because again, you know, I'm the CEO and the owner of my studio, I do a lot of hustling, but I have to do this a lot. So I uh, I do my spiel, hi, I'm Jay Olivo, I'm an executive producer, blah, blah, blah. I go through my kind of filmography, and then Will stops me, like, you know, maybe like a quarter way in. He's like, Jay, he's like, I know who you are, and uh, I'm a big fan. I just want, I saw your name on the email, and I had to meet you. And I, and then at that point, I thought to myself, this meeting's going to go well. Yeah. And so I basically, you know, pitched them the idea of like, let's do, let's translate Cradle into an animated series. Um, but, as, but I told them, for, for the fans, let's do it as if it's a director's cut, or a director's cut in terms of writer's cut. Have him look at it, because he wrote that seven years ago, look back at the series and like ask himself, okay, now that I'm retelling it, what kind of things would you do differently? What would you plant seeds earlier that you'd later pay off uh, so he got excited about that, being able to kind of revisit and work. But I told him, I don't want to change it. Like I told him, I was like, I'm a fan, and I 100% want to do uh, the books of justice. But I want you as a as a the creative to look back at your baby and be like, okay, what what could I smooth out here? What could I do differently? That you know, as a fan, I would pick his brain and be like, what would you change? You know, Tell me more, right? <laughs> and so that's how it all kind of got about. I got him excited, and you know, we were super excited about you know this project. Man, it's, it's, it's so many people that, I, that I've talked to that you've been involved with that always has nothing but good things to say about That's you, man. Like, they always say, like, you come in, you don't, like, you know, you don't try to take over. Like, you, you actually work with them and, and get it where it needs to be. So it's good to hear, like, that that went well. So. I mean, I think the main thing is this, is that when you're in a position like me when I'm adapting something, like, you know, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns yeah. or Flashpoint Paradox, it's, it's a matter of understanding why it's so beloved. Uh, so, like, Flashpoint Paradox, I, you know, I... I I'm so busy at the time, I hadn't read the comics. So when I was assigned the, the script, I, I did a lot of research. I, I took the forums, I read the entire series, yeah. all of the, what was it, 26 episodes, I mean 26 uh, uh, comics from different series. Yeah. I read it all, and then I really tried to understand why it was so beloved. And then I stepped back and, and asked myself, you know, as a filmmaker and as a storyteller, what do I like about it? And then I then, you know, kind of translate that. So the versions you see, like for example, Dark Knight Returns, is my love letter to the 10 year old Jay Olivo who read that, that, that book and just changed my life, right? And so what you saw me translate there was just my love for the, the medium and not wanting to change it, but at the same time understanding that it is a different medium. It's in animation yeah. and it's a very different kind of flow and, and making sure that the, the beats that I know and love is there, but also the fact that it also progresses smoothly as a, as a film. What's like, like the collaborative process with you guys? Like if you really truly like feel something, I mean, are, do you like put your foot down or like how do you how do you work that out? You know what's funny is that the lights are amazing to collaborate with. So I actually, um, when we, we knew that we were going to move forward, I flew out to Florida to them and I spent a week with them and I just picked his brain. I asked him tons of questions. Now I hadn't finished the book series at the time. I was only about like five books in. So I told him, don't give me any spoilers, but how do you see these characters? And I would draw in front of them the characters and say, does this look like what you're thinking? Um, the great thing was, was that like, Will really let me kind of like spread my wings in terms of like what I wanted to, to kind of, what I saw in my head. I originally asked him, was like, hey, there's a lot of art online, you know, from uh, fan art as well as I think some of the books had some artwork. It's like, do you want me to follow that or do you want me to do my own thing? He's like, just do your own thing. So I, I purposely not, I didn't look at anything and I just, so if you looked at the, like the poster, I just took what I loved from 90s anime and I just, I was like, this is what I want. I, I, I love classic 90s anime, that look and feel of like, you know, uh, this is like Escaflone, the record of Lotus War, like that is what I was trying to go for and I wanted to kind of uh, do an animated uh, series that, because that's what I saw in my head when I, when I read the books um, and I wanted to 
kind of do that. So every kind of project I do, I always try to find a new kind of art style, uh, and that's kind of how I approach that. Mm. But yeah, the whites are fantastic. And you know, I have Will on on uh, speed dial, so you know, I'll be like, "Hey, is it cool if I do this?" Uh, but he's been like, sometimes he'll be like, "I didn't think about that. What do you would you do?" And I said, "Okay, I'll do this while I'll do." He said, "That sounds good." Yeah. <laughs> it's it's funny you mentioned Escafone. That's such a deep cut. Like, I don't think anybody here but me and oh, yeah. people know that. I mean, like the animation style was so crisp. Yes. You could tell like how how that was drawn in there, like the way the the. the the, the robot and you know yeah. Bat Bond and everybody in that series is done. And that was got me even more hyped for this as a whole, just knowing that you that you even re reference that. Oh yeah. Um, how, like I said, he, he talked. Will talked about like some of the animation style, but besides that stuff only, what other references will this show have? Because like I said, I, I noticed the characters kind of had like a fire emblem kind of style to them as far as like how, how they look. What other references to anime will we see? Um, I mean, of course, you know, again, all the 90s references of like Cowboy Bebop and like, uh, you know, Escaflone, Rebecca of Lotus War, all the stuff like, so from an anime standpoint, that's what I was going for stylistically, you know, with beautiful painted backgrounds. But the thing is, I wanted to kind of modernize it in some ways where, in terms of the action, in terms of the, you know, camera movements, since it's all computer now, uh, we can do a lot of the things that we couldn't do in the past. And so, what I wanted to do was have this kind of classic kind of uh, look, 90s look, but bring it up to date to what you would kind of see with like a really more crazier anime like, you know, like uh, Naruto or Spy Family, that kind of stuff. The action, the camera work, it looked more live action. And that's kind of what I, would, I was, you know, thinking about doing and I've always wanted to do. But like you said, you, you're, you're a man of a thousand jobs. Like, you know, I, I'm surprised, you know, you say you, the time that you have, like I said, when we see you here every year, you know, you got a different project attached to it. Um, like, I know, obviously, you know, you, you, did the, you work with them, you work with Will and everybody. What, what is outside of, like, you know, kind of guiding, being the guiding hand there? And what, do you have any additional roles in, in, on this project? Uh, I mean, so... Not only did I, executive producer, I had to like pitch it to them and say, hey, let's do this. Yeah. I directed, so the Scissor Wheel you see, I directed, you know, if we make this into a series. I'm directing the, the Kickstarter movie that we're doing right now, and I'm also storyboarding it. Um, but as, as a series, you know, I would bring in uh, my, my crew, and my studio produced the, the Scissor Wheel that you saw, um, and uh, basically I do everything. <laughs> uh, luckily, you know, I mean, I worked, I've been doing this for almost 30 years now, so like, uh, I... I've worked at a lot of different studios. The one thing that I love is I have a studio that I, I own, I run, and what I tell all my artists is this, is that I'm working for you guys. Yeah. Is that like every job I get is not, I'm not looking at like, oh, I'm making some money. It's more about, I get to hang out with my friends for another year or two, every project I get. And for me, that is something that I want them to understand that, that for me, it's about keeping the family together and, and just working on projects that I like. Because, you know, I would work at different studios and be like, oh, I'm working on something cool like Batman, and the next next season, here's Polly Pockets. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you gotta pay the bills, right? right? Whereas at this studio, I can go after things that I know and love. So I, I went after Cradle, uh, we have Infinity I'm doing on Saturday, hopefully you guys come to that. Uh, so what's great is that I can pick and choose with what I want to work on, you know, and, and, and I'm kind of like the, I actually have, uh, uh, I'm steering the ship to, to where my career goes, and also all my friends and, my, and the other artists who work with me, you know? I, I don't know how you've been doing this stuff for 30 years and you don't look older than 25, man. <laughs> I started when I was 19, so. <laughs> I was like, there's no way we talk about career experience by the time. Like I said, I mean, it's awesome when you say you got your own company, you know. Can, can you talk to them about getting merchandise? He, he kind of, he, he, we talked about it, but he was like, about what? Merchandise and like get, get some toys like for the figures for the characters oh, and stuff like uh, that. Well, I mean, that's, that's them. Yeah. I, I'm, just, I'm just involved in the animated <laughs> series. The animated part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if they ask me if there's toys, I'd be like, sure. I mean, I worked for Mattel and I worked for Hasbro in the past, so I, I know a few things about toy, more toy designs and whatnot. I want statues. I mean, I know Sideshow. I'd go to Sideshow. Hey, let's get some cradle statues. Uh, I'm sure that would be in the cards if you know, this picks up. Would you guys want to? Hi. You guys want to ask me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got me. You might as well ask me anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, 
what drew you to the Cradle series? Um, well, I, I read the books, and I think for me it was the idea that you had a protagonist who had no powers in a world full of everybody having martial arts powers. I thought that was really interesting. And then him realizing that his potential can be unlimited if he just puts his mind to it, right, and focuses on it. I think to me, it's something that I think everybody can kind of relate to, you know, because I mean, when I was, you know, like, again, I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, if you were to tell the 19-year-old Jay Oliva that, hey, you would own an animation studio, and you'd be working with, you know, Marvel and DC, and work on all these superheroes things, and then work on, you know, with authors on these books, I would say you are crazy, right? <laughs> uh, but I think the idea is that I worked very hard in my career over the years, but I was one of those type of people that I didn't be like, I want to be a director. I was more like, I want to be the best at what I do, and then hopefully I would get the promotion. And that's what I did. I basically worked every single job all the way up. And, and to me, it's more, I think it's my work ethic about like working hard and hopefully like that paying off, but not expecting. And I think a lot of people expect it too early. And I tell my artists, because I also teach too. I was, I've been teaching for like 20 years. I tell them, my, my kids that um, don't be concerned about getting that promotion. I said, be the best that you can be. Because when you get that promotion, you know, unless you're really good at doing the job underneath you, you're going to be like deer in the headlights. You'll be scared. Which is why, like, when I worked for Zack Snyder on Man of Steel, when Zack called me, I was already doing superhero stuff. I was working at, I was already working at Warner Brothers. And so I'm doing it with Zack, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is easy, right? Because I've done this a million times. But if I had done this and not done superheroes before, I'd be scared. Ready? Yes. Okay.